Welcome to the seventh and final session in the series we've called L&D's Pivot to Performance, in which Guy Wallace and myself, David James, speak with esteemed guests about their own pivot from learning focused practice towards a performance orientation that more predictably and reliably, let alone efficiently and successfully, achieves demonstrable results for both employees and organizations. Over these seven sessions, we've invited guests that we know have made the pivot and have achieved real results from doing so. We've invited our guests to share their stories. We've questioned them on their approaches and encouraged them to share relatable experiences to inspire you to either initiate or enhance your own pivot. We've also sought opportunities for you to get involved too. Now, one last time. Guy, should we kick off with our, uh, uh, our introductions? Please, let's do. Okay, so uh, uh, as I mentioned, I'm David James. Um, and um, I suppose most notably, I spent um, eight years at Disney running Learning Talent and OD. And my own pivot to performance came when in that position, uh, I realized that I was no longer being asked for training courses. I was asked to make actual change. And everything that I'd learned in the classroom for the last 10 years wasn't as useful as I'd hoped. So hence, I, uh, I trod on this path. Guy? Yes, my name is Guy Wallace. I've been in the business since 1979. In 82, I became a consultant. But I think I was one of the lucky few in that when I joined the profession, I was taught the methods of the late Gary Rumler, Tom Gilbert, Joe Harless, and Bob Mager, uh, four outstanding individuals in the uh, learning and development profession or training and development, it was called back in the day. And they all had a performance orientation. And so they looked at times beyond learning if it wasn't a knowledge and skill deficit that they were confronting with their clients. So I learned that kind of an approach to be wary of just answering the client's request with instruction when, in fact, there may have not have been a knowledge and skill deficit at the root of their cause or their problem or their opportunity. Um, I'm partnered with David so that we could try to bring to our audience the people who actually ha- are doing this nowadays and uh, have experience doing that. And so uh, let's continue with the uh, introductions. Wonderful. Thanks, Guy. Uh, and before we get into those uh, those introductions, I would like to, to welcome our panelists, first of all. Welcome back, our panelists, I should say. Anne-Marie Burbage, Dawn Snyder, Sebastian Tindall, and Steve Villachica. Welcome back. Um, so if we could do some quick introductions then, perhaps uh, we can start with you, Anne-Marie. Yeah, thank you for having me back. Good to know that I got a re-invite. Thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm Anne-Marie Burbage. I have worked in learning and development for 15 years. Um, started out in a general estate HR role and then specialised. Um, it's interesting, I've been doing some reflecting. I did some consultancy. Most of my work has been in-house, in-house L&D, but I have done some consultancy. And actually thinking back, one of the things that always bothered me a little bit was you know, how I was unable to make the same kind of relationships and assess the impact of, of my work in those roles. But then when I more recently moved into an L&D leadership role, that was something, a vision that I was really keen to create. So what does good look like from a performance kind of point of view for learning and development and then take a team on that journey? Not me. Wonderful. Thanks, Anne-Marie. And Dawn? Hi. Thanks again for having me back. I love to talk shop. And uh, like Guy, when I started in the field, um, I learned some formal methodologies that were really performance focused. I love having an impact. And so in my work, I do a lot of work with performance analysis and a lot of work in evaluation. And when you're evaluating the work that you do and the work that others do, it becomes very quickly apparent what strategies and what things are really having the impact that's intended, um, while others just kind of give lip lip service to performance. So I'm delighted when anyone has an interest in performance and moving our field forward so that we can have an impact on our learners. My practice is mostly curriculum development for capacity building and high stakes performance. And uh, I operate mostly as a consultant doing this work. Wonderful. Thanks, Dawn. Uh, Sebastian? Thanks, David. So thanks for having me back. Um, I guess I, I, I owe a little a bit to yourself, David, as I've mentioned in a number of, of podcasts. I think I've been doing the, the role now for about 14 years. I've held strategic roles at, at, at the Co-op Bank, Santander, and I'm now the Head of Loan Development of Vitality. 
um, I guess upon reflection, a number of those those years working that that counter fourteen, I, I was probably doing it quite wrong. Um, and it took that epiphany to kind of make me realise that and look back now and say, you know, if I knew what I knew today, I would have done things so differently. And, and I, I guess that's really spurred me on over the last few years to completely redefine how I see L&D in an organisation and try and redefine how others see that and try and push the boundaries of what what we can do to add value to, to the businesses that we work in. So it's been a brilliant journey, but absolutely trying to voraciously push forward and find out what, what the future is. And I think that's what we're all searching for and why we're all here today. Wonderful. Thanks, Sebastian. And finally, Steve. Thanks, Guy and David. I'm so glad to be part of this panel today. I'm an associate professor of organizational performance and workplace learning at Boise State University. We're an online master's program. Before that, I was a performance consultant for almost 20 years. Our OPAL program focuses on performance improvement. We're about working with adults in the workplace to improve organizational performance and produce valued results. We've been online since 1987. Uh, In addition to consulting, I provide pro bono consulting for nonprofit organizations and graduates. And I'm the co-founder of a process management lab that helps nonprofit organizations build capacity by improving process, uh, thereby helping them better meet their missions and serve their communities. Wonderful. Thanks, Steve. Uh, And just to remind uh, those of you who've joined us, um, we, um, the panel are here to, uh, to answer your questions, uh, either about initiating your pivot, either exploring, um, um, the experience of uh, of our panelists so that you can understand the pivot or perhaps to enhance what you're already doing but if you could pop your questions in the q a we've had some questions uh, in already uh, and as uh, uh, as a segue between uh, this session and the last one uh, steve we'd like to continue the conversation that uh, that we that we had a couple of weeks back because charles jennings submitted a, a question that uh, that we didn't get chance to uh, to answer and he asks um, have you used the business model Model canvas approach to support solution design, particularly to divide, uh, to, particularly sorry, to define and enable effective holistic L and D solutions rather than formal training. Um, no, I hadn't thought to do that. <laughs> um, it could be a really good idea uh, mm. if your organization is already used to using business canvases as a way to pitch ideas and solutions. Then I think it's you know, certainly they're modifiable and you can include information about the performance gap, its causes and how those solutions relate to them. Mm -hmm. Um, And so what's neat is it's a one page representation of something complex. Um, There are other ways of representing this stuff. And I think uh, that brings up a larger question of how do you show this stuff to especially senior people who have the attention span of gnats. And you know the, the neat thing about the canvas is it's a one page representation of something complex. Mm. Uh, in his Anatomy of Performance, Gary Rumler has this neat one page diagram that shows the story of a performance gap and how it affects the entire organization, its processes and the people doing the work. One page. Uh, I also think that uh, graphic artists are powerful and we have opportunities to work with them in ways to depict the story of our performance gap in a similar one page, easy to digest format. And uh, I think what, thank you very much, uh, Steve. I think what we've um, discovered during all of these conversations is whilst um, we employ a a performance orientation, we do that in a different way. I wonder if anybody else uses uh, a similar, perhaps one page, uh, either uh, graphical or uh, or way of um, uh, of illustrating the um, uh, solution design. Well, I'll go in with... um... Full disclosure, I Googled the business model canvas this morning. Oh, yeah. Because I thought, well, that's quite interesting, you know, because I'm learning. I'm learning mm. when, as I go through this. And actually, when I look through some of the questions in there and the template, I think it's really interesting. It pulls together a lot of things that I think that if we're, if we're you know, working well in our roles that, that we should be thinking about. But I've never seen it laid out quite like that. So mm. I, I, um, I encourage anyone to take a look, actually. Mm. 
it's particularly helpful. I mean, um, uh, what, one piece of advice I had when uh, when I had a, I, I was running the UK Learning and Development Department at Disney, and I had a mentor outside of the organisation. I said, "What is it that I can do to to ignite uh, business conversations with uh, with my stakeholders rather than um, rather than learning conversations?" And it was really easy. You say, "Well, when you see them in the lift or in the coffee queue, you ask them, how's business?'" And that was it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's amazing the conversations that you have that you're not talking about learning and you really are shifting perceptions from uh, of yourself and your and your value. That's what I like about the business um, model canvas. It has you thinking about the business that you are that you're supporting. Um, if we uh, if we then move on, it's, it's encouraging to see that we uh, we have questions in the uh, in the in the Q and A already. Uh, thank you very much for that, Kayla. We'll come to it uh, very shortly. Um, but we have a question, um, Anna Marie. I wonder if uh, we can if I can uh, I mean, I could ask you this one to start with. Um, you've made the decision yourself that you want to stop simply making learning stuff and chasing engagement, and you want to more closely align your effort to making a demonstrable difference, i.e., predictably and reliably affecting performance. How do you convince those around you in L and D, your boss in HR, and your senior stakeholders who simply ask you for training? Mm -hmm. And also whoever might be an end customer that comes asking for training, I guess. And yeah. and it's interesting. I promise I'll give an actual answer to this question and with some advice. But my first thought is, um, why why do you need to? Why do you need to convince other people? You know, like what what's that? You know, where are you? And actually if you just need to convince yourself firstly to make make a start and this is our you know this is our performance enablement right why do we need permission to do a good job in our world and so just have a just mull over um what that what that convincing looks like to you and what you will have when you feel like you have convinced everybody mm. uh, before you take those steps forward but I promise i'll give you a proper answer um i think for me i did not at any point just wake up and go right that's it no more training um it was definitely evolution not revolution and I think kind of take that pressure off I think start small because mm. you can scale up um so the convincing I think for me the biggest convincer will always be data and evidence mm -hmm. so um you know I think one of the first things I'd be encouraging people to do is look at start where you are now what data do you have now what what evidence what kind of measures what impact is you know so if it's something that you're doing already what impact is that ha having now that you want to change if you're not doing anything yet what's the current as is state that you're looking to impact because it's much easier to demonstrate progress or demonstrate impact if you know the point at which you started at um i think in terms of convincing uh, what what does the person you're trying to convince need to hear from you Mm. put yourself in their shoes what does uh, kind of safety look like and I would be always encouraging you to start with something that um, maybe is less risky I think your convincing job is much harder if there's high stakes for the person that you're trying to kind of get on board to try something different um, and then once you've got your evidence once, you, well, once you've got your data you know where you're starting from you've kind of reassured somebody and you've, you've picked something small and low enough risk to at least try something anything just try something different give it a go if you're going to fail fail fast iterate learn build and keep going and actually go again you can go around that cycle several times in the time it takes you to scope out design roll out deliver get feedback on a training solution so i think the convincer is probably reassuring along the way but don't feel like you've got to have that that kind of permission and that approval right from the start for the whole thing build it as you go and then those those stories become your success stories and your convincers going forward and you grow them. But I think the other thing that does come to mind with this question is I think um, there's some L&D development needs in here. There's some of our skills that we need to think about around influencing, persuading, negotiating, maybe coaching, selling a vision, data, evidence, being able to track down the data, tell a story using the, the data and the insight. Um, and then something around what I would call the product mindset, but the bit around continuous improvement, being okay with that. It doesn't have to be perfect straight out the bat first time. So you, when you're, you're trying to convince people to, to kind of do something a little bit different, know that you'll probably bump into some stuff on the way. Don't kind of make promises right at the outset. You know, I'm convincing you of this, of this thing mm. that's going to be perfect because it probably won't be, but just can we have a go? But I would say the convincer is probably something data-based and not so high risk that the person, the customer feels like there's a lot at stake for them personally. Yeah. 
but I'd encourage everybody to do a bit of a self audit about how they feel about this and those conversations and think about our own performance enablement. Yeah, thanks, Amory. I think that, uh, that that you're absolutely right there, and I've been in in that position where personally you put quite a lot of weight on getting something right or getting permission to do something whereas perhaps what we're being asked to do get involved in or to address doesn't actually carry as much weight for the stakeholder in uh, in their own mind well perhaps it does that they want it done but not not in the the method perhaps where, where we think we want to create uh, or deliver the perfect um, experience or uh, or program they don't want perfect. They just want something that that makes things better. Mm-hmm. And we make assumptions, don't we? You know, when we hear, yeah. well, I want training and, you know, we've spoken about this before. That's their vocabulary because that's what they think is the right thing to say, you know, and so mm. they ask for training. It doesn't mean you have to deliver training. Mm. It could be all sorts of things. Yeah, wonderful. It's what you said in the uh, in the conversation before. You take a request for training as a request for help. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's a, that's a, uh, an, uh, a very productive way of, uh, of doing so. Uh, Sebastian, what about what about you? Um, uh, what what? So, if you've made the decision yourself, and of course you you clearly did, um, what is it that you needed to do, if at all, to convince your your stakeholders, your your boss, and uh, and uh, um, the rest the rest of your team in L and D? Yeah, so I guess there's there's a, there's, a, there's a couple of bits in there. I think when people come and and ask you for training, you know it's a solution presented to to a department and i think there seems to be a misconception with with l d professionals that we're the only department that gets that but we're not and if you spend time in other departments they have exactly the same gripe you know like it's, our online sales aren't good enough i want you to rework our website you know that is mm-hmm. happening all the time it's exactly the same conversations manifesting themselves i think that the challenge is is that you know I guess I see it every day. I'm trying to be level, but it's something, you know, they're, they're trying to get something solved. It's, it's mm. just as Anne-Marie says, they're trying to get help, you know, and the good news is they value people development and that's why they're coming to you, which is again, part of the battle. So I think from that moment, you know, they're, they're seeing you as an outlet for a training solution, but what they aren't seeing you is a department that can support with the diagnosis of issues. And I think if you can first position yourself as, a function that can diagnose the root cause of a problem, that is just part of the value that you can add. And that is the start of that process. Mm. And I guess that the panacea is we have a problem. Let's get L&D to take a look at it and find out what that problem is. And I guess the way that you do that, you, you have to hold yourself to account for asking the right questions when it comes to, you know, a balance of common sense, judgment and experience, just as Anne-Marie says, you know, it's something that happens over a period of time and it is a practice and it is a skill. Mm. Again, it's those that those, those standard questions and I'm sure everybody has, has, has gone down that road, but, you know, you want training. What do you think um, that training will solve? Uh, what is the problem? How have you quantified the problem? And, and the conversation can just snowball, you know, from there. And there's, there's a million ways to, to kind of deal with that. And you can practice it every day and get better kind of as of now. But the one thing I'll, I'll leave as, as a parting point on this and it's for people to reflect on is that as L&D professionals and particularly as strategic leaders, we've got an organisational responsibility to make sure that we're investing our team's time to generate the maximum value. So as a result, we need to make sure that we prioritise the most pressing business problems. Mm. So if we can find those problems, the conversations will quickly flip as well. So it's not to put too much weight on the conversation, find the issue, and then you're really talking about those th- those good things. Like you were saying before in the lift, David, you know, how is business is a pretty weighted question and you'll uncover a lot of things from it. Mm. Yeah, you really do. Um, and if I can stick with you, uh, Sebastian, for uh, for the next question, um, one um, one comment or, or or question I get probably above all others is some somebody saying to me they'd like to modernise, but their line manager won't allow it, but won't won't give them permission. So it's usually L and D people saying I don't I I can't do this. So they're anticipating um, either pushback or a tricky conversation with their line manager. So either their head of L&D or head of HR. Have you ever had resistance in that regard? And how have you handled a tricky conversation with those above you um, in, uh, uh, who, who are accountable for, for, for you and your team? I think I have. Probably someone's had it with me 
Um, and I've also spoken to a number of people externally who want kind of advice on this sort of thing. And I, I think it's really difficult to condense conversations that can happen over an extended period of time into into kind of short responses. But I kind of do my best, you know. Mm. I think it always starts with having to pick from the beginning in order to broaden the scope of what you are perceived to do as a department, mm. the wider value that you need to be adding. Now, obviously, if it's your manager, then you need to approach that conversation with, you know, the courtesy and care that it requires. As you know, I, I understand that can obviously be daunting, mm. especially if the current setup of the team is, you know, perhaps a little bit antiquated and, and traditional. But you know, practical advice. The first thing I would recommend is to start to get closer to what projects the team supports and why. Mm. How do we decide where we invest our time, what we work on, and why? And again, it, it doesn't matter if you change any opinions at that stage. That's just good practice to know. And I think once you start to become ingratiated into those conversations, I think the next thing to do is to start to get closer to um, how those needs present themselves. You know, if you are being presented a need by your manager to say, hey, go and work on this project, then the best thing you can do, and it's cliche for a reason and absolutely to underline um, the, the point from Anne-Marie is to get into the numbers. Mm. and they're early questions to your manager like what are my measures of success on this and and how will we know we've solved the problem can really start to turn the conversations towards performance issues again getting into the data and understanding the process of how things should work mm. i'm talking specific detail there how they do work and what the barriers to performance are they're all pretty nuanced and easy things to do without whipping up a formal antiquated process. They're just good practice questions. Mm. And again, you, you, you're, you're going to start increasingly creating forensic solutions that might and possibly, hopefully, won't be training based. And I guess mm. the, the, the best question you can ask yourself and, and, and potentially you know, to your manager is, imagine that we couldn't train anyone on this how could we still make sure they get it right every time? Mm. And as long as whatever you suggest impacts the success metrics, your foot is in the door and the rest is up to you with what you do once your foot is in the door. So I think that would be my, my practical advice. But of course, that's not to minimalize that that is a pretty tough conversation to have wherever you are. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Sebastian. And Steve, I'm sure you've seen this as well. You've got a, you've got a young buck, somebody who's eager and keen. They've been at the front of the class from the thought, I'm, sh I'm sure this isn't adding the value that uh, that people are telling me it is. So you go to your boss, somebody who has risen through the ranks, doing exact established L and D practice. So they've they've all been promoted and rewarded for for keeping things the same. And this young buck thinks, no, no, we want to be doing something differently. I mean, how do how do you approach those tricky conversations, or do you have, you know, the stories of uh, of how that's been done successfully already? Sure. Um in my experience, um, line managers are great. I love working with them. Uh, mm -hmm. And the reason is that they have business goals and they tend to be straightforward. The goals tend to be understandable. Uh, and we can present ourselves as the folks who can help them with the messy people parts that are related to achieving those goals. Um, I also like them because it's important to remember that economies ebb and economies flow. And line managers are the folks who can advocate for folks like us when organizations are cutting people who haven't recently done anything for them that matters. Uh, and so uh, in addition to agreeing with everything that, Simon, uh, that uh, Sebastian said, I think it's also important to ensure you're ready to play with them first. Mm -hmm. uh, and that means building your own or your organization's uh, intelligence network that can provide timely, credible, useful information. So you need to do some research. Who are these managers? Where are they coming from? What are their responsibilities? Uh, who are their predecessors? Uh, can you relate what they do to the organization's mission, its vision, its values, its strategic business objectives, and its portfolio of current strategic initiatives? Uh, and then, you know, armed with that, I, I think, you know, using that how's business question, uh, you can start approaching them uh, to explore what keeps them up at night and what's getting in the way of their meeting their objectives. And then 
you have the ability to start aligning things you can do with what's important to them. Mm. And I think the starting place is being sure that you're ready to have a good conversation with them. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, Steve. Dawn. Um, so, so many, many learning and development functions will be established already. There will be a curriculum uh, that, that keeps uh, many of the team busy, either in administration or delivery. Uh, and there will already be a suite of e-learning, perhaps in a, in a fancy new LMS. Can you retrofit learning solutions like courses and e-learning to become performance solutions? Well, you know, I'm glad you asked me that because right now we're remodeling a kitchen. Mm-hmm. And when you're retrofitting, it's not different really so much from remodeling and your ability to be successful kind of has to do with how close the original is to the results that you want to achieve and to the current purposes that you have. So I say I'm hopeful and I, I abhor waste. So if you're going to make changes in anything, I try to capture the value of things that are already done and already working. That being said, I hear a lot of people talking about retrofitting when they really haven't done an analysis that is sufficient to understand the gap in performance by all the stakeholding audiences and understand the cause or causes of those gaps. So they really want to start with a solution that may not be justified in the first place. There's a reason that when we start fresh, we're solution neutral because it allows us to take advantage of the efficiencies of finding the lowest cost solutions and putting those in place first, seeing if we're getting some impact by checking our leading indicators and then moving to things that are more complex or more sophisticated or just more costly overall. So when you're retrofitting, one of the things I I guess I would advise people to think about is to be very clear on the purposes and, and then understand what things have changed. You know, one of the things that happens, for example, in curricula, and of course, these are more long term, more longer journeys that we take people on. If the market changes and you're getting different people coming into your organization and starting in your curriculum, your curriculum may not be working because you actually have changed your target audience without acknowledging, you know, you're just calling them new hires. So one of the things that I think is very helpful to monitor and understand at all times are who are the stakeholders and what are their needs and how are things changing you know, as, as time goes on, what forces are, are causing changes? And if you've inherited programs that you may not think are effective and you need that justification to retrofit, I would start with some really good analysis work, or I'm sorry, really good evaluation work that can help you justify additional efforts to expand um, the depth or breadth of the solution to be more impactful. Yeah, what I, what I like about that, Dawn, is it's not a case of asking the question of what have you got? It is asking the question, what works and how do you know that it works? I'm sure that there are learning and development teams who are very busy maintaining their curriculum. But as to answering the question, how do you know that it works beyond people are showing up? You know, it's a it's a very it's a very different set of questions. And Marie, do you have any uh, uh, any response to experience in this one? Yeah, and you know, look, I, uh, I love all what Dawn said, and I agree with you. I just think that, you know, for me, there's definitely something around the mindset that is, of course, you can retro it if that's right. If, but of course, you can chuck it out and start again, if that's right. And, and of course, you can iterate, if that's right. The point is, what what we got, what we not got, what's working, what's not working, what could it be? And, you know, sometimes, you know, we ask kind of these questions, you know, if we couldn't fail, what would we do? Or if we had a magic wand, what would we do? Or... You know, this is here now, but if we hadn't, I think it's what you said before, if we couldn't train on this, what would we do? So the point is, this is your product. This is your responsibility to make sure you're you're driving something positive. And so can you retrofit it? Yes, if that's the right thing. But so can you also not, if you don't think that's the right thing to do? Yeah. Um, and just taking that mindset of actually, you know, my goal is to add impact, it's to drive 
individual or business performance um, or both hopefully mm. and and so whatever the potential outcome is yes yes you can yeah great thanks very much emory um so we do have questions in the uh, in the q a and before i hand over to uh, uh, to guy um, for those, if uh, if anybody uh, in attendance would like to ask any other questions, um, either to the panel at large or or, or into, uh, to individuals, then please do so. Um, Guy, um, I, I understand we we do have some questions uh, to kick us off. Yes, we do. We have a couple um, from Kayla, and I think this has been kind of answered already. So, but but her question is, how do you tackle your very first pivot attempt? Without a portfolio of completed work, I guess some uh, success stories, I'm finding business buy-in challenging. They need to know everything is a hard hill to get over. So I think that uh, perhaps Sebastian and, and Anne-Marie have kind of answered that one already. So let me shift over to Steve. Steve, uh, you, what would be your uh, recommendations on how to begin to establish buy-in when you're trying to do something perhaps different than the, what the request is all about. <laughs> In addition to what uh, Sebastian and Anne-Marie have spoken about, um, I think the uh, I would add uh, grow your sources of business intelligence so that uh, you can find opportunities that are ready for that performance pivot. Uh, the other thing is if you can't cite your own work, uh, include in your organizational intelligence efforts, the collection of things that are similar. So we've never done it here, but our competitors at ABC did something similar and here's what they did and how we might be able to do something similar would be um, my first approach to that. Uh, the second is to pick those opportunities carefully. If this is the first time you've ever done it, and it's never been done in your organization before, uh, you can look to find something doable with minimal risk, or you could look to find something doable that has more risk. And uh, determining that level of risk you can uh, undertake is going to be a hard decision because sometimes it's the risky places where people are going to be most willing to try something new uh, and you need to be able to deliver. Conversely, uh, finding something that's similar that may not be as risky, you know, and if you could get adequate sponsorship might be a good place to start. So, you know, grow your sources of organizational intel first, provide or identify similar cases and be ready to make decisions about risk. Yes, I think I, li I like that. I always think that you've got to, you know, work with your requester, your client, your stakeholders, and let them be part of that decision making. Should we try something different now? Is this the time and the place to do this? And share the decision making, or at least pose to them what some of their options are, um, and let them know that you're on their side and you're willing to, you know, go whichever way that they, you know, see as best, and uh, and and go from there. Don, how would you? How do you approach that? How do you establish buy-in when there is perhaps resistance and where the client wants? learning content and that includes everything. How, how do you uh, handle that? Well, you know, I would have to echo what everyone has said. I think you've gotten some really good advice. So let me give you a couple other pieces. One is I don't tell them necessarily that it's different. I just do it. And in order to get sometimes outside the learning box, you have to have different partnerships and you, you define your system boundaries differently. So you have to be very, very conscious of who you can partner with and what the organizational culture or structure can bear. So um, I would say if you can do it, you may not have to ask permission. You just get people excited about doing the thing that seems to make sense to them. The second thing that I would say, and I often see it in novices, uh, especially just folks who are right out of a graduate program, who have learned some concepts and learned some theories and really want to bring that to the party, we have an, a, a tendency to want to educate the people that we're talking to about what's going on in our minds. And frankly, they don't care. Um, we just need to stay focused on the solution and what we're bringing to the party. And so when you encounter reluctance, 
Um, sometimes it's because we've actually put our own barrier out there and then we have to climb ourselves over it. And if we don't make it a barrier, if we just, uh, you know, when I had kids, I would grind up vegetables and put them in meatloaf and they ate it just fine. And I didn't say, here's the meatloaf and Hey, I ground up all these vegetables that you don't eat otherwise. And I put it in there. You don't always have to say, hey, I'm making this big change and you're not maybe going to like it. So I think in addition, again, to what others have said, I think we need to be conscious that we're not creating our own barriers and that we're, um, again, taking a, a whole solution focus and we don't care what we call it. We're just getting the pieces in place to make sure we can implement it successfully. That was uh, excellent. Uh, that reminded me of something that I learned from a, a colleague that uh, some of us know, Jim Hill. He would uh, his, his clients was looking at Tom Gilbert's behavior engineering model, and the client said, "What do you call that thing?" And Jim said, "What do you want to call it?" <laughs> so, um, just just to let the client be part of all of that. Let me go to the next question here again from uh, Kayla. Um, this is a, this is targeted at Sebastian, and this goes back to his earlier uh, uh, session with us. And and I'm going to ask everybody to respond to this here. But uh, she was intrigued by your reactive intake form process. And can you talk about a little bit more about the the process of developing that form? Who was consulted? Uh, what did the first couple of uh, beta attempts look like, et cetera? So how did you get to where you are with your intake process and the form that you used? But what, what can you share with us? Yeah, so I think the one thing that I'm pretty mindful of um, is that one person's bureaucracy is another person's rigor. So, you know, having a having a form in an organization for some people will go, Hey, that, you know, that doesn't work for me. And there are definite, you know, there are sliding scales in, in terms of how you approach this. I think when I was, I've learned this from Microsoft Excel courses, God, I've trained some boring stuff in my past when you think about this stuff, but there was an old rule with Excel, which was if you're doing it manually every time you're doing it wrong. And it's a, it's a rule that I apply to my own life. And I, I realized that I was sitting down with stakeholders who were coming to me and I was having exactly the same conversation every time. And, and after about 200 times in, I just couldn't be bothered. And I thought there's got to be a better way of doing this. And actually, how can I make that process informative for both parties? How do I get them to complete it, but actually it helps them articulate their business case, their problem, their performance issues in such a way that actually it's an exit point. And it's, it's really interesting that when you get it right, people will contact you and say, I started completing your form. I went through it and actually I realized what the problem was. So I don't need you. And then you go, ah, oh, brilliant. You know, we have arrived. That is where you want to get to. Obviously it wasn't like that to begin with, but I guess the biggest issue, the biggest issue we found is, and again, you are what you need to be in an organization. It's not as simple as saying, you know, we, we're going in this direction. We are a, a huge high change organization. Things change at the drop of a hat every single week. The byproduct of that is the traffic of perceived training requests into my team are huge. And that causes you to respond in such a way that, you know, for me, it's not good enough to sit in an organization and say, we will serve um, whoever shouts the loudest absolutely not this is about getting into a room together and arbitrating the business case based on the perceived value of what this is going to deliver pounds and pence wins if you can articulate your business case well well then it'll win and it'll get results fantastic so i think the departure point for that form really is to make sure that people are coming to you and actually doing it in a considered way that says this is how it will influence our organization's performance and results if you can quantify that there's a really good chance that actually they've gone through and looked at the data themselves now look we will go through the data as well but what we will find is is that the form is there as a framework but it should feel like someone can pick up the phone to you and say I'm trying to do this, come and sit with me. And the irony is you then sit with them and you look at all of the business MI that they're completing and you start to get exposed to all of those issues 
And actually you start to say, well, we were talking about this, but we've both just seen that. What, what are we doing there? What is the issue there? And you start to learn so much about the organisational areas that you support. Some of the problems are the same. And I guess that form is then circulated amongst stakeholders because everybody suffers in their own silo. But actually, very rarely do we go to people that we don't see on a frequent basis and say, this is keeping me awake at night. Because there's a professional decorum that says, you know, especially in, in the UK, how are you doing today? And you must say, I'm fine. Even if you are doing absolutely terribly, people don't go, oh, my God, I'm having a problem with this. So this is just a way that actually we've seen it connect stakeholders to go, I'm having exactly the same problem. What are you doing about it? Well, I did this and it works. Why don't you do that? All of that is part of the organizational development framework that can help just sharing problems with people. So I just think that the form, yes, I take it. You know, it's certainly a bureau- bureaucratic approach. But actually, it's, it's, it's caused so many positive byproducts in our organization that I'm, I'm kind of aggrieved to get rid of it. So I, I do keep it. But uh, I do realize that that might cause a few frowns in the room. <laughs> well, I'm all for those that kind of an approach. And uh, if I don't ask somebody to fill it out, I fill it out for them by asking them the questions and letting them see where this all goes. And then I give them a copy of it afterwards. But I want to shift to Dawn as a consultant, and and I see you're raising your hand, Steve. But Dawn, as a consultant, it's a little bit different when you, when you're doing an intake for a potential project. You know, you may have to bid on it or whatever, and you may or may not get it. But what's what is on the front end of your process that's equivalent to the intake and understanding exactly what what the issues are and uh, what the what the client's ideas about the, the issue and the solutions are? Well, that's a great question, Guy. And I have to say that my intake for my work is pretty similar to the intake that Sebastian talked about. And I've helped, um, you know, my clients develop similar intake kind of forms so that they can very quickly sort things that are going to have a larger business impact and are worthy of additional investigation from things that are, uh, you know, we want training to say that we've done something. Um, I think the thing that I always ask in addition um, to what somebody internally might have to ask is I have to make sure that the sponsorship is in place for the potential solution. And one of the biggest mistakes, I made this mistake, gosh, more recently than I would like to tell you, I undertook the responsibility of trying to help a client get some results and she was not properly placed in the organization and didn't have sufficient sponsorship. That project was doomed to failure because you have to have, in order to do performance solutions, you have to have the change management support to implement the solutions. You know, you can't come in and say, we think you need to change the incentive structure if you don't have someone on the team who has the juice to bring the right people to the table to even have that conversation. So in addition to the kind of questions about business impact and and the ability to get access to the resources you need, you really have to make sure that the organization is positioned and ready, that this is not your client's pet project, that you have access to sponsorship, And that there's really an energy by um, all the groups of stakeholders to carry this thing through to some conclusion. Yes, thank you. Steve, as uh, somebody who's uh, involved in a university program, who also has the consulting experience of, of dealing with the things on the front end, what is it that you teach your students to look for on the front end, to clarify the request, to understand what the stakes are and who the various stakeholders are. How, how do you approach that in the program at Boise? Um, the same way that Sebastian and Don are talking about. Uh, I, I don't think there's a lot of variability in there. It's, you know, it's choreographing a conversation that's able to turn, I need me some training into a more productive uh, conversation. Uh, about uh, business needs, uh, goals, things that are getting in the way, and then sponsorship. Uh, Because without adequate sponsorship, we're not going forward. Uh, The only thing I could add is uh, uh, we tell our students that 
uh, essentially the promise we're making or offering is that we're going to involve significant short-term uh, and significant pain for the potential of long-term gain. So if we're going to play together, you need to sponsor this in ways that will provide the right people in the room as we need them. Uh, if we are getting into uh, solutions that might involve learning, we need the opinion leading subject matter experts in your organization. And if it doesn't hurt to give us access to those people, we're talking to the wrong ones. Uh, if we're going to be uh, doing adequate discovery, we need to be doing it systemically. And we need to be talking with all the people who are involved in this situation. And we need to talk, uh, we need to collect different kinds of data in different ways. And then like a good detective, corroborate it. But for us, it comes down to this promise of, if we're not talking about something that's important enough for this trade-off, short-term pain, long-term gain, then we're probably not really using each other's time well. Yes, thank you. And Marie, so from your perspective, what, what have you, what are your secrets of success on the front end of engagements and working with uh, uh, the requester and, and the various stakeholders? How do you approach that? Well, uh, well so in the, I'm thinking, listening to everybody, um, there's kind of a maturity model, right, that sits alongside this. And some are more mature along this journey than others. I would say we're quite early on, actually. Same thing. So I have not had the conversation successfully a couple of hundred times to the point where I'm desperate to get a form in place, which, um, but I think that, you know, I guess that I, I'm on this journey the same as, as everybody else and, and all the I've people that joined us. I've never done successfully 200 times. <laughs> Let me just add that caveat in there because they really weren't. <laughs> no, and, but that's it, isn't it? And it, 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 it's... Um, so it's definitely more conversation based for me at the moment, but asking those kind of questions. And actually, one thing I have learned is that um, it doesn't all always happen right at the beginning. You might get a little bit of the way through and go, actually, there's something else. There's something else has presented itself that I, I didn't know about. And that's all OK, too. And we just deal with, you know, make decisions around what you know at the time. Um, but I think when you're taking that more more a smaller cycle of iteration and an iterative model actually you've, you've got scope for that and you haven't kind of promised at the beginning i'm going to go out and i'm going to solve all of your worldly problems in one hit and if i don't i've failed actually it it's taking things on much more of a journey so yes it's conversations yes we have funnily enough we have you know quite recently i was part of a conversation where there was a, a form so we formalized that conversation into questions but definitely that in its own right, will take an iterative approach to how well that form does the job. And actually what, it's a bit, I guess, like contracts. The reason why contracts end up so long is because people bump into things and that forms another clause in a contract, right? That's probably what, there will be more questions. And I, I think probably get to a point where not all the questions are relevant all the time, but they help to shape the conversation and, and they help to get people thinking in a slightly different way. Um, so yeah, it, I'm definitely earlier in that journey. Yeah, I think that uh, one of the things that we all need to be cognizant of is that you can ask all the questions and get perfect answers on the front end, but through your discovery or analysis process, you're going to uncover additional things that might be critical or just uh, um, distractions. And so we've got to be careful about that as we gather intelligence. And I think this is why it's important to bring your client along in the process of analysis or discovery. You know, waiting until the end and then surprising them with the big ahas that you've uncovered it, it may be too much too late. And so uh, keeping them informed as you go along the process when you are confirming, as Steve said, uh, wh what it is that you've been told at the very beginning, like a good detective would be corroborating. Um, I think, um, sorry, Guy, what I would just add is I think that also brings us back to those things at the beginning what are the skills what's the capability required of us because yeah. it's not just that you know a form won't do all the work for you there also needs to be you know this kind of data establishment that data interrogation telling a story with it pulling it all together um relationship building trust building influencing this is change this is kind of sales in some respects you know you're having to to bring people along on that journey and that you know so we have to look at our capability what are the skills yeah. that, that we need to have in place and what do we need to feel quite confident with in order to go in and have these conversations? Because we've got the toolkit, 
you know, I think everyone here, you know, it's not just training, there are other tools in our kit, but actually getting from training, it's something Steve said earlier, getting from training to, well, I've got these other things or these other conversations that we could be having. That requires a different skill set on our part and, and confidence yeah. in different things. I, I think that's absolutely right. We, we may not have a staff in place that has the competencies that are required for this, and sometimes, if depending on how we divided and conquered up the work, we may have people who work on the front end and people who work on the back end. And so we need to make sure that the people that we have in place in our own processes are well prepared for doing that work. Unless everybody's a generalist and everybody's doing everything, um, the world has gotten too much too complex in our world for generalists to be, I think, ultimately successful, unless it's a small operation, but you can't be a graphic designer and a videographer as well as a business analyst successfully. Now, there are people who can do that, but but uh, I, I, let me turn it back to David here uh, for our uh, wrap-up round. Yes. Um, I, before we wrap up, it's um, we've got we've had uh, a great deal of uh, of interest in uh, uh, in this series, uh, both in terms of um, signing up and attending, and in listening back to to the recordings. Has anybody got any other final pearls of wisdom? You've uh, you've been involved in two conversations now, each of you. You you get the uh, the gist of the uh, the questions um, and perhaps some of the uh, the challenges being faced. Uh, would anybody has anybody got any other final kind of words of wisdom um, to uh, to share for those who'd like to follow in your footsteps? I think I would I'd probably just just add that, um, and as a, as a point that I think we've we've all made, um, is is this is absolutely an iterative process, and I think mm. once you're trying to explore in your organisation what works, um, you, you know that it's only going to work potentially in your own context. And, and, and doing sessions like this and speaking to, you know, fellow L&D professionals is absolutely critical because I, I, the future of, of L&D exists. It's just not evenly distributed yet. And mm. absolutely, it's taking things from some of these conversations and experimenting in your own organization to try and work. And I think if anybody is is listening at home um, or, or is present today that have tried something in their organization has absolutely worked no matter how small I would just encourage everybody to be open with sharing it um, either on LinkedIn or, or, or emails afterwards because that's why we're all here is, is to learn it and to hopefully get better. Wonderful thanks Bastian. I would say just make a start somewhere mm. find something because you can talk yourself out of this quite easily <laughs> you convince mm. yourself otherwise you know we, the question right at the beginning you asked me was how do I convince other people what do you need to feel what do you need to know what do you need to be convinced of before you just make a start get out of the traps and learn as you go and I think that that can sometimes feel a little bit uncomfortable but but no it probably will feel uncomfortable you know we're mm. used to having all the answers we're used to standing up and being the sage on the stage or whatever um but what's the thing what's the what's the smallest thing that you can do to start to build your trust, your confidence in others um, and, and have a go. Mm. Because, you know, if you wait, I think I've said it before, if you wait for, for permission and all the stars to align and, and you'll talk yourself out of it. So find an ally, find a small thing. And, you know, I think like Steve said, sometimes the bigger things are because they are, they will have the biggest impact to the things where people are prepared to be a little bit more um, brave perhaps. But it, just for you, even looking at your own self-development or, or, or in your team, you know, what one thing can you start with to just try and do something different and build your confidence along the way? Don't go from kind of nothing to a marathon overnight. Wonderful. Thanks, Emery. So I would I would add to that because I do a lot of work with emerging talent. And so you you definitely want to start small. You're going to be working differently because no one person can do this in a silo. We expect instructional designers to work with subject matter experts, but they, they have a very limited input. When you're doing performance improvement work, you're collaborating with a lot of stakeholders over a lot of organizational lines. So to Anne-Marie's point earlier and Steve's and, and I think Sebastian's as well, there's a new skill set you need um, in terms of that relationship building and collaboration. And I always advise people that they need to have the analysis and the evaluation skills. You have to understand how organizations measure success, how performance is measured, and how you can 
find existing data or create measures that will help you bring your insights to the table. And so that, those are some good starting places. And if you're considering that pivot, that's a place to maybe begin or to enhance in order to be effective. Wonderful. Thanks, Dawn. Uh, Steve, anything to round us off? Um, it's been fun being in a conversation where our panelists have already touched on all the things that I'd otherwise say uh, <laughs> and have provided very sage uh, guidance. The only thing I can add is this stuff ain't rocket science. Mm -hmm. I work in a college of engineering. I know rocket scientists. Uh, <laughs> this isn't it. Uh, this stuff is pretty straightforward. It's pretty doable. And so I think if you grow sources of organizational intel, if you look at upgrading parts of your skill set, uh, I think you will find those opportunities to start small and, and grow success over time. Um, and I think this is an approachable and doable thing for most people uh, and, and in most organizations, but it's getting over the initial fear of trying in many cases. Wonderful. Thanks, Steve. Uh, and once again, thanks, Anne-Marie. Thanks, Dawn. Thanks, Sebastian. And finally, again, thank you very much, Steve. If I can extend a thank you to, uh, to Ken and Philip as well for, uh, for their involvement in the series, uh, which has been hugely enlightening for me. And I know we've had an incredibly uh, positive response uh, for those who've attended and uh, listened back to the recordings. Guy, can I, uh, can I throw it over to you and ask uh, if, uh, if, you, if there's anything you'd like to say to, uh, to help wrap us up? Well, I'd like to answer Kira's question here uh, about uh, wondering about some ways to get better at the business talk, understanding the language of business. Mm -hmm. I've been uh, recommending and, and, de and developing staff in the past when I've had them on financials. You know, what's a cash flow analysis? What's a balance sheet? What's an income statement? If you don't understand how score is kept in your enterprise, you can't play the game very well. Mm -hmm. So that's a start. Now, every business industry company uh, or institution has its own set of language. You need to understand what that is. But, but the financials, I think, are, the, are the, the cash flow is the life's blood of an organization. And you should understand finance and how things are done and looked at in your organization so that you can align with that rather than fight that. Mm. Yeah, I agree there. And when I was at Disney, we, uh, we serviced 14 different business units. And one of the key parts of, uh, of my job was to find out how they made money because that's what, they're, that, that's what was important to them. And if you understood how they make money and then you're curious, you have your conversations uh, around that with them. And if they're not, um, uh, uh, they're not in the business of making money, they're a support function, how do they add value? What is their reason for being? And then you, again, you have your conversations around that. Uh, thank you, uh, Kira. What what a lovely way to uh, to end the uh, the series. Then with that one final question. Thank thank you everybody for uh, for showing up today. Thanks everybody for uh, for uh, downloading uh, the podcast or watching the recording. Uh, this has been an absolute pleasure uh, to to be involved in. And guys, already twisting my arm to do, to do another series next year. So uh, so watch out for that. But in the meantime, thank you very much for uh, for being involved. Uh, and take care till then. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.